This presentation is an intensive theory session, although much of it may well be new to you. In this session, you will observe the effects of asymmetry on the horse and rider, consider the influence of the rider on the horse, explore the neuromuscular basis of equitation, and define the biomechanical requirements of basic equitation. First, I want to show you quite a disturbing film on the effects of rider asymmetry on the horse. And all I've done is taken a skilled, experienced horse, although she, she's a young horse, and uh, being prepared for eventing. So she's in the early stages of that. Good basic obedience, no problems there. And an experienced, skilled rider. So all I've done is made a couple of interventions to mimic asymmetry very subtly and to look at the effects of this on this horse who's not used to an asymmetrical rider or to the degree that we have intervened. And the film's about seven minutes long. So we have a horse that's moving quite well. Do you think she's happy? We're, we're, look at the facial expression. Happier yeah, now. we're happy with that. What I'd like you to do now is, could you put one of your stirrups up? Obviously, I, I'll leave it to your choice. I want you to be crooked. Okay, off you go. Same again. Now let's see what the horse thinks of this. Although she might be used to these compensations, we don't know. Okay, you can instantly see the, the saddle now going to the right. Uh, choppy steps from the horse? What else? She looks slightly lame, doesn't she? She looks that there's some signs here. She's worried. She's anxious. Trust issues, maybe? Are these horses... Yeah, the back end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's happening to this back end now? She's hiking the right hind over. She's happier on one rein compared with the other? Yeah. Okay, let's see that. Cantering. Oh my God. Ooh. <laughs> The way she's being thrown. Yes, I mean Nicola's doing a really good job here. You can't actually see that Nicola's crooked now, can you? But, <laughs> but you know she she is. But but the feeling on the horse is that there is something not right here, and she's trying really hard. Bless her. Can you see her trying to do some compensations, yeah. fiddle about perhaps with the load? Oh, what's her face? She's looking a bit sad. I mean, I'm feeling a bit sorry for her now. Um, but where's our cadence gone? Where's the forward movement? Look how stiff and stilted she is. And the canter. I mean, the canter's fair because she can offload a bit more. And she can throw her rider around a bit more. So that's fair. Oh, okay, yeah, horrible behind. Yeah, okay. Oh look, she, she almost can't um, be fluent and smooth with the hind end. Okay, stop there. Let's put her back. Let's put the stirrups back to where they were. She's not settled, is she? We've upset her. And do you know what? We've put her to the normal factory setting. She's still upset. We only did this for a couple of minutes. She's still upset. She doesn't trust. Okay, this is getting better. Come on, Fierce, everything's all right now. Can you see how much of an effect asymmetry can have, even five minutes of it? And out come the whips, out come the spurs, out come the very elaborate pole exercises. Uh, out come all the instructions. Yeah, get your leg on, leg on, more, 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 more. Oh, you can't ride this horse, you better go and get another one. Oh, there's something wrong with her. Oh, 
she seems lame. Better get the vet. Yeah. So can you you can see the difference now we have uh, a good quality event horse. Whereas earlier we when we changed to asymmetry, or I should say a little bit more asymmetry, <laughs> um, you, you get a riding club horse that's even probably wouldn't win much at riding club level. I'd like you to show some strides of balanced riding and then a few of unbalanced and if maybe if you alternate between the two and see what you get. Obviously I don't want you going flying off around the school. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> Okay, that's a little bit okay. So we've got a very sensitive horse here. Just, just calm her. Just, just calm. Nice and calm. Just go back to the factory setting. That's fine. That's fine. So when I say novice, just perhaps mistime the rising a little. Just a little ah, uh, just miss time. Okay. Yeah, now go back to your normal timing of rising. That's it. Lovely. Great. And miss time. Okay, great. So We seem to have a mare that actually lets you know uh, when things are not quite right. How about next time you come round, let's just have a little bit of feel backwards in the rain. So uh, a backward feeling con con contact. Yeah, that's it. Backwards rather than forwards. Bit backwards. Bit backwards. Ah. Now, how backwards would that be? A few ounces? The hands don't look particularly tight. Oh, okay. Good. Okay, just give her a rest there a moment. Can we have you tilting the weight forward or back next time you come round past the pink oxer? A rider with, with not very good core strength. Okay, so she's sitting on the back of the saddle now. Back of the saddle. And a bit forward. Oh, she likes forward. <laughs> she likes forward. Yes, ah, I see. But not Kate, she's not Caden, is she? The balance So, some clear signs of compensation distraction, confusion, anxiety, lameness, clearly uncomfortable, unbalanced and the list goes on. So I think this horse and rider combination make the point very well that there is a problem with the rider being asymmetrical, their posture, and there is a problem with it. Most horses with asymmetrical riders have become accustomed to these riders, and so they shut down and don't bother to try to communicate their discomfort to the rider. And these are the horses that get the blame for the rider being, or their posture being asymmetrical and that goes undetected. So what we tend to do is then start the horse on a program of better equitation. And clearly we should be addressing the rider more. So an interesting summary made by Mary Wanless uh, receiving a Saddle Research Trust Award in 2018, just sums this up so very well. How we sit on the horse matters. The horse cannot not be affected by our influence and our wiggliness, our shoviness, how we support our body weight or don't, 
how our centre of gravity is organised, what's happening with our asymmetry and whether or not we can match the forces of the horse's movement. For welfare and performance, for me, we need more skilled riders with good biomechanics. That is ethics in action. Well, from my point of view, we need more symmetrical riders and there's not a lot of skill to being symmetrical. So let's see how we can achieve that. Quick overview of the rider skeleton. There are four curves in the spine for optimal stacking and shock absorption. One, two, three, and the sacrum makes the fourth. And this is to facilitate absorption and transmission of perturbance and force. So it's like a long shock absorbing strut, the type you might see under the bonnet of a car near where the wheels are. Otherwise, a car would be far too bumpy to ride in. This means greater potential for disc herniation because there are curves. And an asymmetrical posture is due to injury, the furniture, so what you sit on for any length of time or slouch on, one-sided tasks, there's plenty of those around the stable yard, incorrect lifting technique that can injure your back and then set up compensations, or it could just represent overexerting and straining a muscle or habitual lifting patterns stress which could result in general tension psychological stress and workplace ergonomics uh, particularly that so many are seated in front of a computer operating a mouse and this may be misaligned and off center to your posture and studying of course where you have students or learners just hunched over books you'd hope or iPads or PCs. The pelvis is central to movement particularly seated on a saddle and the core muscles engage in the neutral pelvis to stabilize the spine. So it's very important how the pelvis is angled front to back in the sagittal plane underneath the vertebral column. And that can affect the recruitment of muscles to stabilize the spine. More about that later. And you've got a heavy cylindrical head balanced on a vertical neck. So there's a lot of movement up there with the head and the neck. And given that the head is about the same weight as a bowling ball, that's a lot of weight to have balanced on the column of the neck. So that can affect the symmetry of the load going down through the upper body and into the seat bones in equitation. So the musculature that's involved in equitation, we have the pectoral muscles here stabilizing the shoulders, deltoids holding the arms in place, the biceps for shortening the reins and the arm rotator muscles there. We've got the external obliques and rectus abdominis. This is all for trunk stabilization and the muscles of the thigh and the ankle. And here is a representation as functional axes. So in other words, this is just showing you where they originate 
and insert and the effects that there would be on movement. So we can see that the pecs are directly involved with stabilizing the arm against the chest, deltoids there for flexion extension, biceps, which will raise the, and when relaxed, they will lower the lower arm, and rectus abdominis, which is attached on the pubic symphysis and the sternum. So you can see why it would be strongly implicated in stabilizing the spine. We can't see quadratus lumborum there, all the spinal muscles. And we see those in this picture. So this is erector spiny and the trapezius. So this is what's stabilizing the head along with sternocleidomastoid from the occiput to the sternum or the clavicle collarbone on each side of the neck there laterally and here we have latissimus dorsi again this is a back stable a spinal stabilizer and it draws back or retracts the arm triceps there retracting the lower arm and quadratus lumborum there which is a lateral flexor and what's missing from here talking of hip flexors is iliopsoas which would appear on the anterior spine and insert into the proximal femur. Gluteal muscles here, supporting the pelvis. The hamstring group, which retract the hip joint and flex the tibia and here is the support for the ankle or gastrocnemius soleus and the relaxing of this muscle will dictate how much ankle dorsiflexion there is and again we have a representation as functional axes for this setup. So with the rectus abdominis, there's not a lot to prevent the spine from flexing forwards. And here you can see the these muscles in action. So we have some rotation of the shoulder girdle and of the trunk and of the pelvis we can see that here and the effects is to seat the rider asymmetrically exerting an asymmetrical load down through the saddle and this loading is in three planes so it's from front to back so in this direction side to side in this direction here so the rider would perhaps lean to the inside or the outside of that saddle. And rotationally, so thinking about how the shoulders perhaps are positioned in relation to the horse's ears. In terms of rotational asymmetry, I want you to take a good look at the anatomy of the core stability musculature of the rider and understand how rotations of the upper body and or pelvis can occur with muscle imbalance. Obviously these muscles are on each side of the body but it's just easier to show them on two separate sides. The green, red and gold muscles are iliacus so as major and so as minor and note their attachments on the surface of the pelvis the vertebrae and the femur 
On the posterior of the skeleton is quadratus lumborum and on the side transverse abdominis. So imagine these muscles contracting. You could also imagine them as being strained or overused and asynchronous with their firing times as a result or imbalanced in terms of muscle development and perhaps stronger or weaker in relation to each other. And this is where core stability can be compromised in function. The loading of the pelvic floor is unlikely to be comparable when core stability is impeded. And this is why it's critical for the rider to be rotationally aligned, particularly through the shoulders, ribs and pelvis. More about this later, but in all cases that I have encountered when working with horses and their riders, the rider has to hold their rotational alignment in neutral to create wither lift and a lighter striding in their horses. So frequently the rider is coached to keep shoulder, hip and heel in vertical alignment when viewed from the side and to keep their spine central in the saddle when viewed from behind, but few correct the rider rotationally as if looking at them from above. Rotational alignment is the greatest, easiest win a rider can achieve with their equitation posture, but it requires a clear understanding of evaluation and postural conditioning to know why and how to achieve it. Because very often correcting the rotations in the rider will correct the shoulder hip heel alignment and the spinal alignment from behind. So your shoulder, was your right shoulder back, so contract your shoulder muscle. Plant your ribs together and get the thigh heavy. And the point of this is that Tanner now is pushing up in front slightly. If you look at his withers and his, his legs at the front, the, the limbs, he's pushing up, up. And this is really good. So he's going to push up before he drops his nose down. So we ignore the fact that you think he's waving his head in the air. He's not. Yeah, that's a really good behind. Really good, really very great, stable. Yeah. And also note the role that the diaphragm plays here. It shares a connection with the thoracolumbar vertebrae so that if the rib cage can be positioned and breathing can be used to facilitate this then the rider is going to have a much better connection through the upper body with the saddle and I also want you to note that the rider's left diaphragm is not completely symmetrical with the right and notice that the right has slightly more substantial attachment to the vertebra so that the left side attaches downward to the second lumbar vertebra but the right is slightly more securely attached because it extends to the third lumbar vertebrae. So you could say that the body is asymmetrical or unbalanced to begin with. So that needs addressing. A pair of dynamic towers, the limbs and cables, the muscles, support a suspended back. And I did a study about 12 years ago where I palpated 33 horses spines for the presence of muscle spasm of the dorsal spinous processes. 
So where we stand towards the back of the horse and scratch either side of the tail, we can see the horse flexing the lumbar sacral joint and lifting the trunk or not, then gently lowering again. And the head, neck and limbs anchor the center section. The rider is seated here on the weakest section. So what I've done is I've put a horse's skeleton and I've mapped it against the results of my investigation. So you can see it corresponds fairly closely with the horse's spine from the atlas to the lumbar region. And I've done it from side to side and there's a fairly similar pattern from side to side. What this shows is that the strain is not necessarily in the mid back. So there you have some absence of misalignment and muscle spasms in the mid back. And you would question this either the saddle region is not affected by the rider so much so as to cause muscle spasm or it moves less because the rider is blocking the movement therefore blocking any tendency to develop muscle spasm in that region but what it could demonstrate is that there are areas more remote to the thoracic spine that are more vulnerable such as the lumbar sacral region spinal flexion consumes considerable energy at speed the faster the gait the greater the requirement for spinal stability and the spine has to support and counterbalance intrinsic and extrinsic forces applied to it. But the equine cannot utilize spinal flexion significantly to increase stride length and in turn speed. So it differs from a greyhound which can utilize spinal flexion. The horse has to reduce the movement in its spine the faster it goes. And that increased rigidity is for support and reduced energy expenditure during the sprinting. And most movement is in the wither region towards under where the rider's seat bones are. The horse must lever the rider's weight to flex dorsally and collect. And what that means is the horse has to somehow counteract the vertical downward load of the rider in order to push up in front. And this is facilitated by the hind limbs, which must remain in a slightly more prolonged stance in order for the horse to push up through the thoracic limbs. The hind limb supports the spine. So the further that it moves under, about to under where the rider's seat bones are, or towards more where its center of rotation is, more about that later, the greater the support it can give to the spine and the more balanced the horse will be as the hind limb moves under or closer to the center of rotation. And equally, the horse's hind limbs can move out behind it more. So if you watch a horse moving and see how much the hind limbs either reach under or paddle out behind it, you can see or determine how much the horse is able to truly support and balance itself. The cervicothoracic joint moves up and out to seek the bit contact or to balance or lighten the forehand. So 
this is a whole process of the ideal horse movement where they push up in front but in order to do that it involves the hind end so making the horse look pretty in front has really got nothing to do with the head position and everything to do with the biomechanics of the thoracic sling and where the horse is placing its hind limbs more about that later and in that movement pattern there will be reduced strain on the thoracic limbs so in too many cases i see the rider blocking the horse's true natural movement of it wanting to bring the hind limb under towards its center of mass or rotation but the rider is sat there and if they're not supporting themselves adequately or if they're asymmetrical this will block the horse from seeking that balancing movement and from pushing up as a result so taking a look at the horse saddle rider combination uh, dear rider here we're not evolved to control balance and stability from our seat this is totally alien to the human body in terms of evolution and here we have only 50 percent of the body in contact with a surface so therefore there's 50 percent contacting a surface and the other 50 percent is hovering above it therefore it is unstable we're in the western world naturally inclined to be chair seated what a surprise so this may be for much of the day the position that we find ourselves in so head tilted forward shoulders perhaps slouched if the back or the spine is not in line with the pelvis or hip joint and strain here and instead of the foot being under the pelvis which is the desired position for precision riding it's out in front and i think we associate this chair seat with comfort muscle imbalance will result from this position so tight hip flexors and stiff lumbar spine tight or short hamstrings and protraction of the head and neck and we can imagine now what happens when this seated person attempts to ride a horse and get into the saddles which are made to fit them or which have a generic seat which doesn't in fact fit them at all as well as they could or it's hit and miss as to how well that saddle might fit the rider the ankle is out of alignment and what we have here is a one meter vertical lever bearing down on a horizontal beam it's not easy to well it's easy to sit on a horse relatively but not easy once they start moving less easy to influence the horse's posture but we'll come to that and this rider must absorb the horse's vertical forces from underneath them while communicating or attempting to communicate directional information so some riders have to try very hard to direct the horse in the direction that they're going and this can create a lot of asymmetry it's that shoviness that mary wanless talks about and that wiggliness and this involves the shifts in body weight and limb positioning and this movement it's not athletic movement in the sense of 
a runner or a gymnast. And what the rider has to do is to resist the forces of horse movement to apply those communication aids. So that's the challenge of the rider on the horse. Coming from this as their default posture. And for the horse, they have not evolved to carry weight precariously of a rider and the compressive forces from a saddle onto the back. So here we have the rider aiming or attempting to stay in balance vertically over the horse. And we've got the horse attempting to balance the rider from underneath upward. And if they don't seek to constantly centralize this load, then they could fall over. So they resist the compressional, typically restrictive forces exerted by the rider. And this combination forms a single interdependent torsional or twisty, wiggly, shovey, <laughs> three-dimensional kinetic chain. So riding a horse and influencing the horse and having the picture look good through all that is not as straightforward as it seems. Asymmetries are readily formed. I think, you, I think you'll agree with that. For the horse, it could be spinal ribcage rotation. So this is what the rider is sitting on. So we can see here more of the horse or ribcage on the left than there is on the right and some spinal curvature there. So asking this horse to turn very neatly at the will of the rider is not going to be easy for the horse. So we agree that they are acutely susceptible to asymmetry, especially for the young horse, especially to the horse new to training that may compensate with the load of a rider on its back. Because the rider is striving to remain secure during acute variations in striding. There's a proactive reactive dialogue, so clear feed forward and feedback channels. And this is not just the rider, this is the horse as well. There's a dialogue going on between them. As the horse gets in balance, it will try shifting the rider. As the rider feels the shift and the imbalance, the rider will try to influence the horse or they'll change their posture. So very difficult to, or very challenging to have a symmetrical horse and rider combination and then throw in the saddle and look for that to be symmetrical too. So this is why we have to look at the horse saddle and rider in combination and this is why symmetry really does matter. And they must be able to interpret signals from each other. So to direct, the rider is directing and the horse to be directed. Respective forces of gravity must be resisted. So they both equally have forces, the same forces of gravity, but the balance is different. As I said, the rider is dealing with balance that's coming from below and the horse is dealing with balance as it comes from above. And both components need sufficient core strength and balance. Surfaces affect the balance of the horse and effort levels. Competence develops with balance capability. And what that means, in other words, is that performance will develop and progress 
along with the capability for maintaining balance with every step. And that is with varying gait, terrain, speed and direction. And this is why it takes years to train a horse to competence within their discipline. The saddle, which mediates between the horse and rider, facilitates mechanically efficient locomotion. As the centres of rotation of the horse and the rider seek rhythmical synchronicity. So that's the whole point of riding a horse is remaining in balance and a big part of that balance is marrying up these centres of rotation, making horse riding look effortless, but it's more of a problem when the rider is asymmetrical. And unfortunately, the majority of saddles are not made for individual rider seat confirmation. Remember how I said that the rider does not naturally seek to balance from the pelvis or being seated. The rider or person has evolved to walk upright. Therefore, they gain their stability and information for that stability from the feet. There are far more proprioceptive structures in the foot and ankle than there are in the seat or pelvis. And think about the ridden session having thousands of repetitions of aberrant movement. And the effects this is going to have on the horse, and also if you have an asymmetrical horse, the effects of that asymmetry on the rider, which will cause musculoskeletal discomfort, dysfunction, and ultimately injury. So it really does matter. So let's look at the potential for equine asymmetry and how it may form. Static signs would be the spinal rib cage rotation. So you can get behind and above the horse. And as we touched upon it earlier, take a look at the spinal rotation and see how much is of the rib cage extends to one side. The pelvic tilt, so you can palpate on the tubercoxy both on top and see from side to side. You can see here my thumb is higher on the left than on the right and also when you place the fingers cranially or in front of the tubercoxa, you can then determine which side is further forward than the other. So in two planes there. Muscle imbalance, well, you can look and compare from side to side all over the horse. And the general static posture, you can see how the horse uh, is preferring to load over its limbs. And with four limbs making ground contact, the potential there is for force asymmetry. So you can see perhaps how the horse may lean and how there may be a difference in the force that the horse exerts as it makes ground contact. So these forces can differ in a rotary action. So in walk, the four time beat of the limbs, one or two or other, may be pushing off with a different force to in relation to the other limbs. Same for canter, which is an asymmetrical gait anyway. And in gallop, they may even change the pattern of the hooves mate, making contact with the ground. Diagonally in trot, so this diagonal, this limb and this one may push off slightly differently to this diagonal. 
altering the movement vertically. It may be different horizontally, so from front to back of the horse, the horse may push with the hind more than or, or pull with the forelimbs and there may be a difference there. Vertically, you may have a mediolateral tilt. The pelvis is wider than the shoulders, so as one of the hinds pushes, the horse may fall out one side compared with the other, and that is simply because it's built with more bulk on the pelvis muscularly than it is on the shoulders although the head can be implicated there too, which would be a trajectory deviation. So the horse just may not move in a straight line and may move with the shoulders in or the haunches in. So let's take a look at some of those concepts in action. We've got the horse not moving in a straight line, potentially because of the pelvis exerting a different force to the shoulders and forelimbs. We've got some asymmetry through the spine. And some some muscular asymmetry. Right, so uh, if there's uh, no questions, uh, or if there are just ask <laughs> okay so uh no questions at all it's good to see you all suitably mesmerized uh, by that <laughs> if you are <laughs> and uh, yeah so so now we have the next part of the presentation which is about uh, 40 minutes so then uh if you can get through that i will give you another break <laughs> So considering the rider and the saddle load, the weight of the rider, if we take walk as the baseline weight, so let's say this rider is 75 kilos, then when they start trotting, that could double as the load being exerted onto the horse. And canter in a straight line, not even looking at turns here, that could triple. So 225 kilos. And we haven't even jumped the horse and rider yet. So that's considerably more forces than just the weight of the rider on the horse statically. Some weight is absorbed by momentum of movement and stretch recoil mechanisms and flocking. So that's more about weight distribution, how it's distributed throughout the body or the back. And what that means is if you could imagine the horse trotting or cantering, that means that the weight load is changing. It's not just exerting the same force. So there are opportunities for the weight to be distributed there. Flocking is an important one because if you look here, this flocking is not sufficient for the weight of this rider. This is a pony saddle and this is an adult. So this is not a particularly heavy adult, but uh, the adult is too heavy for this saddle. And I think we'll talk about this another time, but that's often the case is the problem with heavy riders is that they don't fit the saddles. Is that this saddle, for example, is for was constructed for a, a lightweight rider. And even though this rider fits in this saddle only just, it doesn't fit the rider, but they fit in it so that they can sit in it is just not sufficient. So there is, a variety of flocking out there and until you put the rider on and take a look 
that's that's the only way you can tell that too much pressure is being exerted upon this pony's back. So again, it comes down to a visual check. Obviously, you can see this tree is too close to the horse's back and this horse or pony is just merely standing still. And um, this of the, the weight absorption does depend on whether or not there's any restriction to the striding because the compensatory gait can just send these measurements off all over the place. And it also assumes that the horse and rider are sufficiently balanced. And whether or not the weight is focused around the rib cage or down on the spine. So here, or whether the rider carries the weight off the horse's spine to a certain degree and more onto their thighs. Not easy to spot from the ground. And the combination without optimal balance control will generate greater forces generally. And first thought equine or the WOW saddle company has found in their study that 95% of riders are loading the left seat bone more than the right. Now that is a huge number. I think of the 5% that didn't, they were symmetrical. So they participated in some form of postural training such as Pilates. Actually, 1% of those riders were seated or loading through the right seat bone and the other couple of percent were uh, Pilates. And they also found in riders with this asymmetry issue that the horses had an observable asymmetry of the pelvis. So for the rider, where is their asymmetry potential? They will be left or right handed. They can have muscle imbalance. They can have ankle and or hip instability. You can see that here and here. Their seat bone weighting may be asymmetrical. So you can see in this template made of the seat bones. So the rider just simply sat on a piece of corrugated paper. And you can see the rotation in the pelvis there. And also that the rider is loading or makes more contact with this left seat bone compared with the right. This being the pubic bone imprint here. So that's um, fairly, fairly common asymmetry there through the pelvis. And again, you know, how do we deal with this in terms of saddle manufacture? Uh, I would think have a go at correcting this before you go for the new saddle. More about that later. So you can he see here the asymmetry. We saw this picture earlier, the rotation through the shoulders. Here's the center of the horse. The rider is sitting to the right of this saddle. In this picture, uh, this is 34.8 kilos one side, 35.9 on the other. This is a fairly symmetrically loaded rider. So this is one who I had been working with for several months. So to be a kilo out on the loading on side to side in a 75 kilo rider, that's pretty good. But if you get two sets of scales out and put a rider on it, don't let them look down, let them look straight ahead. Let them get into um, an equitation position and just take a look at where that one-sidedness is and if you ask them which side they think 
they might be loading or if they're equal, they will usually not have too much of an idea unless they're obviously loading to one side compared with the other. But if you straighten them up or ask them to straighten and then you look down at the scales, what you see may not correspond with what the rider feels. And here as the rider walks away, you can't see in this picture, but looking at the waist, they might well protract one hip joint more than the other so that the pelvis moves more on one side compared to the other. And in the saddle, they might be leaning forward more. And again, for the rider, we have the spinal rotation, which we've also seen in the horse here. And this is the horizontal, so from side to side alignment. So if they lean over one way more than the other or put, or put weight in one stirrup more than the other, they'll be asymmetrical. And the vertical alignment if they're leaning forward more. So plenty to go wrong with the rider. They don't just sit there. And what are the effects of good and poor posture? It, it can be observed either as static or dynamic. Uh, this is a very good technique, which we'll be covering later. Weaknesses observed at rest are exacerbated in motion. And this is a good example of the foot or hoof asymmetry being exacerbated in motion so that when this horse begins to move, the hoof angles will impact on the joint mechanics there. And this will spread further up. As we've seen on the treadmills before, you can see the shoulder asymmetry or scapular asymmetry. And this is likely to be as a direct result of the hoof imbalance or limb asymmetry. And athletic performance correlates with an efficient static posture. Postural symmetry will affect coordination, and I think that's why it's very important for riders who are not used to balancing from their seat when we've been when we've evolved to get our balance information from our feet. For this group, symmetry is a big advantage because they're already at a disadvantage posturally. So the posture will dictate gait, it will dictate how the horse moves. I spoke earlier about the difference in pushing off with the limbs, with each limb. And therefore that will dictate the degree of balance and the foot balance. All this movement can impact on how the horse will wear its hooves or shoes. And to have a neutral posture, so no muscle imbalance, no functional asymmetry. This means that the gait or movement or performance will be balanced, efficient and economical. There will be very little to inhibit that provided the surface is acceptable. What do or should we prioritize as the most important correction? The horse, the saddle or the rider first? Answers, <laughs> what do you think? Have a little think about that.
What's the most important to prioritise? Do you think? Ah, okay, we've got some answers coming through. Uh, all of them, yay! <laughs> if you had to pick one though, but yes, it, it is all of them. The rider, yes, yes. <laughs> the rider, the rider. <laughs> uh, you can't straighten the horse until you have the rider straight. So the rider, yeah, well done very well done so it does seem to be a logical place to start so it's the easiest to fix and makes the biggest effect on everything else yes yes uh yes we shall be seeing more of that and in the other group we have all of them yeah so yeah before you attempt any certainly any precision equitation all three of them need to be the best they can be or there will be a problem or two or, or ten. Okay, well done. It depends on the priority of the observer. Unless the observer deals with the horse, saddle and rider as a combination, then they will correct what they have been trained to correct. And unless they've had training in other areas, such as evaluating the rider off the horse, they and the rider will be completely unaware that it's a problem and they may still just keep going for the horse as the problem if that's their area of training. So let's have a look. This is a really good example of how the horse organizes the load this is a fabulous horse saddle and rider combination they're both fit they're balanced they're experienced they mostly hack and they gallop as uh, part of the hacking act activity so we can see that very straight there's no leaning no tipping uh, the horse movement looks symmetrical he's able to turn with ease incidentally that's a flexible saddle so not causing any issues there and you can see in slow motion how the horse organizes himself to turn you can see the rider is vertically symmetrical The rain contact looks symmetrical. The striding looks symmetrical. And again, although the rider's leaning slightly as she turns left, she's not getting a lot of support for that saddle from the saddle. So again, symmetry here. Yeah, she's posting to the trot and the saddle looks, well, there's a slight, slight asymmetry there having a canter this is good so she's sitting still she's stable she's balanced there's virtually no deviation on the upper body and let's compare that with the horse that we saw earlier this horse is desperately trying to organize this load and we can see just the general stiffness and we may see a few lame strides here. Yes, yeah, some lame strides. And difficult to organize. The asymmetry makes this horse difficult to organize. I know the rider's asymmetrical because I have made her asymmetrical temporarily. And the picture's not good. We can see a big difference not happy at all and again just see how the horse tries to shift the rider the rider's very balanced so she's not easy to shift at all but the, the horse is having problems there and again if you replay this just watch how they lose the cadence completely 
because of the rider asymmetry and that's a good rider. So let's just look at the neuromuscular basis of locomotion. How does this all go wrong? <laughs> Where does it go wrong? So movement begins with a conscious desire to move. If I wanted to get up and get a cup of tea, I would consciously think, ah, must get up out of this chair and move towards uh, a kettle. But the flight response, if suddenly somebody flew through the door and shocked me, that would be largely reflexive. There wouldn't be much of a delay if I became fearful of some sudden motion through the door if somebody bursts through the door. And the neuromuscular system, which is the bones forming the levers and the tendons and the ligaments, they produce forces for locomotion, control of the gait, moderation of movement or the gait, stabilization of movement, placing the pelvis in neutral can engage core muscles to assist with that. And taking a look at all that in action, think of the levers being made. So the bones, the muscles, the nerves which initiate this movement, how stable the rider is, and this is all conscious desire to move. The rider's consciously directing this horse's bones, joints, ligaments, muscles, the lever system, and also they're employing their own lever system to move in and out of the saddle. And this is all utilized to move the horse and for the rider to balance on the horse and direct the movement. For some reason, the horse is consciously desiring to look down. Now we're going to turn. Again, the horse has to balance the rider from the bottom up. The rider has to remain seated from the top down. So that's basically what's going on in general gait movement equitation. So what happens when we start to initiate movement? There is a stimulus from a sensory receptor which generates muscle activity and that's generated by nerve impulses which are formed from axons exiting the spinal cord. So in order for this horse to take one step forward it requires muscle activity generated by nerve impulses which exit from the spinal cord. And each motor neuron serves a number of muscle fiber cells. So there's not just one track from the spine to the limb. And the number of fibers or muscle fibers served depends on muscle function, not size. So a limb which just has to move forward and back will have far less motor fibers or separate connections to the spine or brain compared with my hand, for example, which is involved in control and precision movement. So I may have more motor connections, individual motor connections for my fingers than I have in my gluteal muscle. I don't perform precision movements with my hip joint and leg, but I do perform many precision movements with my hands throughout my daily activities. Typing being a good example of that. 
And muscles performing wide ranging strong movements have motor units innervated by many muscle fibers. But for the precision movements, those junction boxes are wired to less muscle fibers. So that's what gives you the precision, the control, the focus. And the muscle fibers of one motor unit are not necessarily sighted together. They may be scattered in within different fasciculi or muscle fibers. Muscles of the pelvis may well be scattered around. And the number of motor units active in a muscle at any one time determines the level of performance of that muscle. So the more activation will determine the level of performance. And of course, the other equation is whether that will be a precision movement or a power movement. So a complex electrical wiring system there in the body. More motor control. Muscle tension that force of contraction is a joint lever pulling force. And all muscles sighted around a joint produce either movement or no movement. An isometric contraction is more readily fatigued. So think about the two point seat an eventer or jockey galloping they hold an isometric position so they're held still out of the saddle and that is much more tiring than continuous movement because the muscles are not getting a rest and sensory stimuli are triggered by internal or external sources to move the joints so it can be gravity from externally or proprioception internally which do the initiating of movement the controlling of movement the monitoring of movement the maintaining of movement and the ceasing of movement so looking at what's going on here with the rider they would receive information either from the environment so perhaps approaching the fence too quickly that would be sensory information or internal information they might feel that their balance requires shifting that would then go in for central processing that might initiate a different type of muscular contraction they would get feedback from that and then that would go into central processing. Did they execute the correct response for what they were sensing in terms of what they selected to be the correct muscle contraction? And for the horse, they would get environmental and internal information in the same way, but they're getting it from the rider also so they would perceive perhaps this muscular contraction from the rider and their shift in balance this would go in for central processing am i going to fall over or do i have to slow down speed up they would then that would then initiate a muscular contraction and they would then get feedback as to whether or not that was the the, the, the muscular contraction was the correct response and we all move happily around the arena interacting feeding forward feeding back sensing altering our muscle contractions and that's how it's done feed forward feedback the director and the directed well that's how it should be and what can make this process a bit easier or what shortcuts can we have? Because this all 
sounds like it's very complex. Gait is initiated voluntarily. So a movement pattern of gait is voluntary. But it requires continuous patterns of flexion and extension. So this horse trotting, flexing, extending, flexing, extending, and that's how they move along the ground. And there are elements of stabilization to counterbalance the shifts in the center of gravity. You can't just extend or flex and extend and hope to remain stable. Something has to keep you upright or keep the horse upright or keep the rider on the horse. And the centers of gravity or mass or rotation are constantly shifting. I think more for the horse than for the skilled rider who merely has to sit still to balance. So the gait maintenance, not the initiation, but the maintenance is mostly reflexive. This is all reflexive. And it's automated by highly efficient, biologically mechanized central pattern generators. And a lot of training, schooling, skills building is the forming of central pattern generators so that new movements can become habitual. The central pattern generators exist at spinal cord level. So a horse that's grazing doesn't really have to think about which leg to move at which time. It can just amble along munching happily without falling over. Requiring minimal conscious thought, it's routine. This is routine, timed, rhythmical, habitual, repetitive movements that are subject to the central pattern generating system. For daily living activities, they allow low priority sensory information to recede from conscious thought. So we can move along, we can take the dog for a walk without thinking too much about where we're putting our feet and how to place our limbs and what stride length we might use. And this frees up the brain space for conscious processing of more meaningful, high priority information and if you relate this to training the horse and the rider with more brain space so you might think uh, think of a novice rider they're just learning to ride their brain space is going to be full to the brim with staying on whereas the more skilled rider can put that on the back burner and concentrate or focus on improving the quality of the trot or turning circles or pirouetting, whatever that precision movement might be. They don't have to think about their balance, usually. <laughs> And it wouldn't be efficient for survival if the brain was incessantly blitzed with sensory information, constantly requiring conscious processing. So this horse can go from grazing to sprinting without having a reflective conversation with itself as to how it can move from halt to sprint in seconds, it just does it. And that's because of central pattern generators are there to facilitate that. And if they didn't have central pattern generators, they simply wouldn't survive. So let's look at some of these learned movement patterns. Before we uh, look at this, and it might help you uh, explain the answer to a question that I've just had in a few minutes ago. Is a flexible saddle a good option if the horse and or 
rider has a large asymmetry or not I'm going to say no obviously without having the horse and rider in front of me or the saddle indeed but I'm going to have to say that an asymmetrical rider would need more support but more so than that they would need more weight distribution across the horse's back so if you've got this unstable rider uh, exerting a force if the saddle was flexible then the forces the asymmetrical force would be concentrated whereas if they were placed more on a bridge structure the that focus would be more dissipated a flexible saddle can become dangerous with asymmetry as it can slip good point i know someone whose saddle slipped under the horse's belly and it bolted Ooh, yeah okay so it, it's the tree point so the head of the saddle is very important and that perhaps if we have a flexible saddle maybe on quite a round horse and it does move or they don't do the girth up or whatever then they're dangerous i found that because i've been checking saddles for about 20 something years i found in my experience in doing that and as veterinary physio was that in those years i only ever came across problems caused to the horse's back two problems caused by wintex saddles and lots of problems caused by flocked saddles and uh, so to me i there's something about them that is protective of the horse's back and it might be that that one piece that synthetic tree it might be that but i just found they caused less problems and i did find that most riders knew when the gullet was a problem and when to change it up and down good well done we're, we're really thinking about our physics now this rider is able to give the rein and still balance so she's not relying on the reins for holding on and the horse knows how to canter with a rider on board the load of the rider without losing the balance the rider's turning and the horse doesn't have to think about how to turn the rider remains in balance on the seat bones the legs are still the lower legs and the horse is pushing up in front into the contact so it's learned how to do this And you can see how the limb comes under the rider and under its own center of mass and rotation to help with the balance. And all is well. So let's review muscle action very briefly. Tension generated within a muscle produces a force across the lever mechanism to produce movement within a joint. So uh, the scapula, strictly speaking, doesn't have a joint <laughs> because there's no clavicle. But um, just bear with me for a moment because the scapula is a very easy example to illustrate muscle action. So first, we need tension. We need the motor neuron via a muscle motor unit junction to contract the muscle. And all muscles sighted around a joint are involved in movement or maintaining stasis at that joint. So let's go to the shoulder joint any muscle crossing that joint with the humerus would be involved in the movement of it or 
remaining in stasis. They have varying roles. Dynamic shifts of the center of gravity stimulate other remote muscles for stabilization. If the muscle contraction produces a shift in the center of gravity or mass of the body, then that stimulates other muscles to also act. And as I said a slide or two ago, isometric muscle activity is readily fatigued compared with concentric and eccentric activity. So compared with joints that are moving. And all this means concentric is the shortening and eccentric is the tension in elongating to facilitate the shortening and the movement of a joint. I'll just say that again because it is very, very simple. When this muscle shortens, in order to do that, this muscle has to lengthen to allow it. When this shortens, it will pull the scapula back. When this muscle contracts, or gets shorter. This muscle has to lengthen to facilitate this shortening and the scapula because this shortens will move this way. So you get the stride back and forward, back and forward, contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. But it doesn't fully relax. There is still tone there. And that tone is what we call eccentric muscle contraction or muscle activity. The sensory stimuli is triggered by an external or an internal source, which we touched on earlier. And again, initiating, controlling, monitoring, maintaining or ceasing movement. It's not just as simple as contraction and relaxation. There has to be, this has to be initiated. It has to be controlled. How much protraction does the movement require? It has to be monitored to make sure there's not too little or too much protraction. It has to be maintained in gait and when the desired muscle action ceases that has to be built into this system too so that the muscles then slow or cease and the horse stands still again think feed forward feedback mechanisms decisions have to be made here whether they're at conscious level or sensory subconscious involuntary level. Quick look at the sensory nerves. There are different types. This looks complex, but think of it as just a piece of machinery. Extero receptors, they're mainly in the skin. These might sense heat and cold as well as pain and touch. The proprioceptors, they are embedded in the skeletal muscles, the tendons and the joints. This is my joint here. And these signal movement, positioning and degree of stretch. So in order for me to successfully get from my desk to the door to get to the kettle, I would have to have some kind of feedback system within my joints that tell me, yes, you're standing up now or you're leaning forward enough to help you stand up. You're not just going to trip right over to get to the door. And that's a form of regulation which allows me to move in balance from one position to another. Interoreceptors relay information to and from 
internal organs. So if I'm feeling a little cold at the moment, I may have got that information from the interoreceptors within my body and basically stimulating me to go and warm up. I might start shivering, which is an autonomic activity. I wouldn't be able to decide whether I should shiver or not. And the firing rate is not always constant. So it may cease with repetition of a stimulus. And just think about when you're being asked to use your more leg, more leg, more leg, <laughs> and the horse just suddenly gets too much of that and just doesn't respond to it because it then ceases to become relevant information to act upon. It becomes just a, an irritant <laughs> to be ignored. And that receptor activity, as I used in my example of the rider using the leg and the horse ignoring it, may or may not reach the body's conscious awareness. <laughs> We've all known what that feeling's like, an un unresponsive horse. Or it may reach conscious awareness for a short period of time. Hopefully using your leg will encourage the horse to do whatever it is you move the leg for in the first place. And the strategy would be of lower involuntary spinal control so that there's no need to be conscious of it. We can get on with doing something else. There's no requirement for input from upper voluntary brain control. Because the brain is adapted for concentration and thought processing, it doesn't need this relentless stimulation from lower level input. You should be getting the feeling or building a picture that movement is very much about coordination and it's sensory and it's possible to master your posture for riding. <laughs> That's what I wanted you to get. So let's take a look at rider postural control. What can indicate that the rider has good postural control, coordination, proprioception, muscle development, symmetry, and just is generally athletic. This is impressive. It's Mark Todd at a demo, and I've picked out the clip which shows him just merely getting on the horse. And from this, I can see exactly what his athletic potential is without him even riding the horse. And you'll see the more novice rider, although pretty good and still skilled. Just... Here she is, not quite as coordinated. And Mark doesn't even have to have the horse standing still for this. So what you can see from that is, I think the most interesting point is that the person giving him a leg up wasn't expecting him to be so light. So it was almost like she was just lifting up 10 kilos there and she underestimated how easy it would be to lift him. So what's that about? Someone who weighs 75, 85 kilos 
can actually spring up and be picked up and supported by another person effortlessly. So all is not lost for our riders. We can do an awful lot for the horse by centralizing the load and more importantly, by stabilizing it. So others will have seen this film, but it's a taster of what's possible in one session in a couple of minutes. Yeah, she's doing it. So she's going up, up, up. Okay, just change back to your old settings. If you just take your hands away from the withers a little bit so you could see, that's it. And just go back to the old way. <laughs> she goes flat. Yeah, yeah, I really felt that. It's almost like the horse just gave up. Yes. If you know what I mean. She oh, no. they do. They absolutely do. That yes. Was huge. Just lose it again. You can almost see her going, oh. You can feel her just go, no. Okay. And let's get the factory settings back again. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, you can see she just creeps up like a she cat. She just gets lighter. Yes. So relating that to the Mark Todd leg up, when you organise the rider so that their energy, their posture, and they are almost in self-carriage and you've centralized them and stabilized them and you get them to hold it that has a big effect on the, their equitation performance and as i said it takes minutes to do that once you've evaluated them and you know which parts of them require the correction and you correct it on and you ask them to hold the correction that's where the magic happens and we will of course be covering that in the presentations to come so let's just look a little more let's really get what is the difference between efficient and inefficient gait because we're aiming for efficient gait that has to be the goal here there's three components to it. Reciprocal innovation of active muscles. So you have to have a power supply, in other words, for uh, gait to work. A balance preserving extensor thrust reflex stimulated at foot level. So you can't just stimulate the muscles <laughs> and uh, have the horse blast off somewhere because all the muscles are contracting there is something happens at ground level as i said the foot for the rider foot and ankle and something similar going on for the horse but at the base of support there is a mechanism which senses balance and influences the horse's neuromuscular system to correct balance and maintain it and then we have the coordination noise reduction in the cerebellum in part of the brain stem and that means that that part of the brain is responsible for removing the or for smoothing out any jerkiness in the movement because it just wouldn't be efficient for the body to just have these uneconomical jerky movements. So they're quietened down or processed by the brain to quieten down. Comfort, you do need comfort for efficient equine gait, as you saw in the asymmetry film right at the beginning of the presentation the horse was reacting because it was uncomfortable and trying to shift the rider to a more comfortable position for it. Or 
compensatory gait will develop and we really don't want that. It's not good for sports performance or long term prevention of injury or strain. And I put the picture of the skull in and the superficial cranial nerves because bridal fit plays a large part in the horse's comfort and of course the bit. So what is efficiency in movement? It's the capacity of the body to organize itself sufficiently to cover the ground. And that's quite simplistic, but the mechanism in which it does that is highly complex. The body is a machine and you can see with the horse and rider, there are two machines together and then there's a, a mediating surface in the middle, which has to perform as well. And this is a picture of me and my young horse, obviously. <laughs> and you can see some, although it's a static picture, you can see some fluency of the movement in her. And I think she was four rising five here. So needed to step under a little more and there's some weakness through the lumbar spine but I'm as stable as I possibly can be. I'm rising to the trot there and keeping myself vertically aligned. It's the least amount of energy required to achieve and maintain the desired pace or action. Aberrant movements represent a state of locomotor imbalance. And balance or equilibrium means that the rider is seated over the horse's centre of rotation. So much easier to be stable and maintain stability if the horse's centre of rotation, which is probably here, it looks, and if that is married with the rider's center of rotation, but we'll look at that in slightly more detail shortly. And saddle placement plays a part here because skilled riders tend to want to sit over the scapulae or where the center of rotation or mass is likely to be concentrated. And you can see that very much in uh, the elite dressage riders. Their saddles are so much more forward over the scapula. Some of them are quite exaggerated. So watch out for that. And all they're merely doing is just trying to get themselves connected with the their center of mass rotation connected with that of the horse. So how about loading the equine spine? There is a distinct lack of supportive muscle in the saddle region. And what there is, is a passively supporting fascia pad. So part of latissimus dorsi, which is not shown here, that's the muscle which retracts the forelimb. But the good news is, is that's the most extensive superficial fascia in the body. And it's the aponeurosis of latissimus dorsi, linking the hind and forelimbs in locomotion. And the force over time will produce or stimulate fascial matrix proliferation, which then causes it to become more dense in this region and as such more protective. It develops progressively. This is a test I like to do to evaluate the horse for rider carrying potential. Don't stand directly behind the horse. I am off to one side, but I want to see how much the horse can <laughs> can flex the lumbar sacral joint. And I want to see what happens yes, when I walk away. What's about? But I also want to see 
the quality of that lift. So we'll look at that in more detail in another film. I'm not just looking for lift. I want to see how the horse coordinates that lift and maintains it. I want to see what happens when the horse is asked to use the lumbar sacral joint when it's activated. This horse doesn't move fluently up or doesn't flex. The horse moves away. It's not happy to hold its back. And it may be that it's a little irritated by my scratching, but I do find, and this is a young horse, I do find that the young horses tend to crank their backs up and possibly move away, or you may get some asymmetry. They may lift one hip a little higher than the other, but they're not comfortable to hold that position and gently let it down. They will often just walk off because they're a little weak to maintain the lift. More about carrying the rider. So the potential of carrying a rider will depend on what you're asking the horse to do. Simple hacking, light work in a straight line, that's not too much of a strain on the horse's back compared with jumping a course of jumps, for example. That would take more strength, stamina and flexibility. It depends on the horse to rider weight ratio. So the heavier the rider, the less capable the horse will be of carrying that rider. The degree of sink in the back, I touched on it in the picture of myself riding the grey horse. This is what I mean, and this is a young horse's back. Often when they're new to training, instead of flexing gently through the lumbar sacral region, they will extend it. They just don't have the musculature here. And you can see that quite plainly. There is no muscle bulk here, no muscle development to suddenly carry a rider. But watch out for that because I know that there are some confirmations which the horse will carry this what looks like sink for the duration as part of its dynamic confirmation. So look out for what muscle development is there and where you would expect the horse to be in its level of training. So yes, it may well be croup high, but worth knowing that if it's there because of lack of muscle development and conditioning, then it could be an issue. It could be a compensation. It could be that you just work the horse in short bursts of activity, give them plenty of rest until the back muscles, the posture has developed sufficiently to flex into and under the rider more so that they can support them more. And the quality of the back reflexes, I just showed you that. These should be offered readily. They should be smooth and fluent. Consistent muscle engagement. Again, compensatory movement may cause muscles to be switched on and off throughout the movement or gait. And the ability to maintain that lumbar sacral flexion, so stamina in the flexion. The young untrained horse will often show resistance or guarding or a disjointed lift. And that's what we saw in the film. They may be asymmetrical and just simply step away because of the loading that we've induced. We've put them off balance by by doing this. They may have poor coordination so that they are unable to maintain the lumbar sacral flexion. Lack of strength 
How does the horse coordinate itself sufficiently to deal with the load of a rider up and down the gates? And their general posture, static and dynamic, and we'll be looking at that in the next presentation in more detail. OK, so what I wanted you to get from that, I think specifically is that last part that. What checks do we do to ascertain whether or not the horse can carry a rider? It's not just the horse rider weight ratios. There are observations we can make and should make. And especially for saddle fitters, as I've got a room full of you here, what you don't have to answer this. I just want you to reflect on it. But what what do you do to ensure that that horse you're fitting a saddle for or how far do you assess their capability of carrying that rider? It's not it's not something that's considered in much detail we take it for granted if that you've got the if you've got the horse to rider weight ratio then the horse should just get on with it but when you look more closely there there is more to it than that so just gave you that bit of an insight there so that you can begin to think of well the Slightly rider does have a big part to play they just do. They cannot just sit there uh, in, in comfort. Any questions? Oh, we have something. Uh, OK, that's a very sensitive subject to discuss with owners too. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what I said. <laughs> oh, about capability of the horse carrying a rider and the the weight ratios yeah there are ways to handle the situation much more sensitively but we we speak for the horse so we have to get over it and be a voice for the horse um, i really check the muscling gates and when riding also how much they sink in the back oh great yeah i also explain that they have to train their horse under the saddle or without the saddle yeah yeah and um, working from the ground and preparing the horse for a rider is is a big part of this. It is more and more, especially as we mix the breed and start fiddling with the confirmation and breeding horses for movement and not for stability. This is the last part of the film that we did not complete last week, and it's more theory. And uh, then after that, I'm going to show you quite an interesting film which should should initiate some uh, interesting discussion or make you think okay so the effects of the rider in the saddle on the equine spine a poorly fitting saddle will reduce back muscle function fairly obvious and the addition of a rider will result in the supportive muscle activation of the horse as it resists greater forces of gravity. So the horse has more work to do with a rider on board and the work it does is resist the forces of gravity and balance against those forces upwards or risk falling over or stumbling. Lowering and raising the head changes spinal morphology so that when the head is lowered, the spine will be flatter. When the head is raised, there's more hollowing there. And a high head and neck, more of an exaggerated high head and neck, means that there is reduced flexion and the horse will be in extension through the back. So what are the physical requirements for equitation? So if we look at this baby on the horse, 
there is no strength there. There's possibly no balance. So what the baby's done or the person has done is to place the child on the horse and their base of support is maximal. There's a lot of contact there which helps to keep the, the baby stable. And then of course as the baby gets older, stronger, better coordinated, they sit up and the process becomes easier. So this is no stability or, or no intrinsic stability and this is further along in the development of the rider. Stability and self-carriage, that's it. And this means that the rider can balance on their seat bones, marrying up their center of rotation with that of the horse as much as possible. An athletic range of motion, proprioception and reactivity. Remember we looked at feed forward, feed back with every stride. Stability, I cannot emphasize this enough. And stability is strength, stamina, skill. Proprioception, what's that? Good example of this is, uh, and there's quite a, quite a few of these videos on YouTube to watch, I was surprised. But how does a dog balance on a rope? It's because it's been trained to develop a supreme awareness of its body position in space and with the foot contact, there is information going back to the spinal cord, possibly the brain, and keeping the dog in balance and upright on that unstable and very narrow surface. And it's a crucial component of the body's execution of general movement, not just for walking on a tightrope. It's an acute perception of joint positioning. So this dog has to organize its joint flexions, extensions, contractions to remain on this piece of rope and also to move along it. It's balanced without the use of vision. It's an acquisition of movement patterns. So it has to be learned. Think of the baby on the horse and babies generally, they have to learn how to crawl, how to walk, how to run. And it has a feedback mechanism for fine tuning of joint movements. And a feed forward capability to aid body placement before it occurs. In a nutshell, it's effective coordination, as in controlled voluntary motion. So looking at the centers of rotation, in the rider, it's more in the pelvic region. So recall that half of the body is in contact with the moving surface and half of it is in midair. So the center of rotation, we can expect it to be somewhere in the region of the waistband of the britches. And in the horse, it's in the caudal or the scapular region. So about where the rider's knee is, about here, maybe further back in the more advanced horse. So you can see there's not too much disparity here and you can see how bringing the saddle further forward would bring the horse's centre of mass or rotation further forward too. And the hind limb placement impacts on the support or 
maintenance of the center of rotation. I explained earlier how the more the horse can bring the hind under towards its center of rotation, the better balanced it will be, the more stable it will be, and the better able to carry its weight will be. Movement increases peripherally, and that means there is a centrifugal force there as load is repelled away from the center. So think of rotation. I know the rider is seated here and should be still, but nevertheless, when the horse is cantering, the rider is moving. And even if they're doing sitting trot or rising trot, they still have to organize their center of rotation. It does move. And also that of the horse moves as the horse possibly shifts up with each canter stride, for example. So the load in rotation is repelled away from the center. Balance and stability is keeping the load close to the center. And you'll see there is less movement near the center of rotation than there is. It has to travel a lot further as you move away from it. So that's how you stay on a horse at all gates. And that straying equals more energy required to return to stillness. So perhaps a more novice rider that does not sit still has to spend more energy collecting and organizing themselves back to the center. So and also using the rider using their leg that tends to destabilize them. So we want a nice quiet rider, a good forward going balanced horse, and then the rider can just sit there and appear to do nothing. So the center of rotation and remaining stable requires proprioception and coordination of the limbs and the back. The position of the center of gravity or mass or rotation, it does have different terms. The body position will be determined by the center of gravity of that body and the area covered by its base of support. This is a good time uh, just to come in very quickly with the fact that if you, well, you'll see me doing this uh, later, but um, in the ridden part of this, but if you put pads, shims underneath the femur, then the rider is so delighted with how much more support they appear to get. So that gives them the feeling that their legs are not just dropping away. But if you pad them under the femur, quite near their hip joints, so under the, the, the skirt of the saddle, if you can get the pads in there, then that can give a lot more a feeling of security to the rider. And that to me is that you are increasing their base of support against them sitting on a structure that just falls away. If you can just pad them a bit more, then uh, it, it's, uh, I think it's quite phenomenal actually how it feels to the rider. And this means that if we're not loaded sufficiently to deal with the forces of gravity, and if there is insufficient base of support for whatever we're doing at the time, then we would just simply fall over. For the rider, this is the pelvis or the seat bones. For the horse, it is the hind or forelimb positioning. So that's what determines the base of support in both the horse and the rider. The center of gravity is the center point of weight distribution. 
So, for example, if you were to, if you wanted to, <laughs> why would you? If you were going to spin this horse and have all have it spinning equally in all three planes of movement, you would the, the center point of weight distribution would be where your pole would go through the horse to spin it basically so it would have to have an equal amount of weight at the front as it does at the back also from side to side so splitting the horse in two on each side of the mane or spine and also horizontally so medially and laterally so it's a complex business and rotating around the center of weight distribution is the point of equilibrium or physical balance in movement. It's how the bodies arrange themselves around the center of mass to cope with gravity and using stabilizing surfaces to do that. The anatomical position of the center of gravity is immediately anterior to the proximal sacrum bone. So for the rider, as I said earlier, it's basically just below the waistband. It will shift with joint movements. Knee flexion will lower the center of gravity so that a person will feel more stable in a flexed position as you often see the sumo wrestlers getting down flexing their knees and getting lower because that is a more stable position and helps them remain standing preventing someone from just pushing them over and arm raising raises the center of gravity so knee flexion lowers it arm raising raises the center of gravity and makes the person easier to push over so the lower the center of gravity the greater the stability So let's have a look at this in motion, the center of rotation. Yeah, you can see in the horse is about here. Which part of the horse is the stillest part? Which part of the rider is the stillest part? You can see it occurring about here and here. Think of the base of support for the rider. It's the saddle for the horse. It's the contact with the ground, the, the width of the base. A narrow base of support would just mean that the horse would wobble more. A leg in each corner is a good indicator of stability. And you can see these centers of rotation or gravity shifting the balance shifts with the joint movements. You can see that as the horse moves around the corner. How does the horse remain upright? It begins to shift weight to maintain stability. So it will do that by placing the limbs accordingly. And that's why you see when the horse is turning a corner, or on the lunge, that's why you'll see the hind limbs brought under more. What the horse is doing is placing or attempting to place the hind limb under the center of rotation, center of mass, center of gravity. And I've said earlier that the seated rider has a high center of gravity because they are a one meter unstable lever. The lower body is supported, but it is influenced by the horse.
or by contact with the horse. We can often see the shoulder hip heel alignment involving the sternum remaining over the centre of gravity. And the equine centre of gravity, this has implications for saddle fit in the girth region. Again, as I pointed out earlier, the saddles are often placed too far forward by many riders, whereas a good saddle fit may mean that the saddle is placed further back. So there's a complication there. The saddle obviously has to fit the horse, but there is an advantage to it being placed or it placing the rider closer to the horse's centre of mass, rotation, gravity. It'll affect the stability of the saddle, optimal positioning of the rider. The horse's centre of gravity is shifted by rider load. So think of young horses and how they can be more on the forehand because naturally they more weight is carried on the forehand. When we add a rider, we're really unbalancing the young untrained horse. And this centre can be further forward or backward, usually forward, and it could be affected sideways by the rider as well as vertically. And locomotion is much more technically challenging for the horse who's just not used to carrying a rider. So with training progression, with the rider loading the horse's frame, there will be more muscle bulk developing over time. The horse will become more upright and they will load their limb posture more optimally under the frame. There'll be changes in the center of gravity or posture rotation and balance of the horse over time. Um, I just wanted to just draw your attention to that point there. So think of a young horse. They have, they're only strong enough to move themselves along the ground. When you actually put 60, 70, or even 80 kilos, if it's a male, when you suddenly load their backs, they, they're not going to have sufficient strength to move with a rider. So that's what I mean when I said that they need to be sufficiently strong in order to assist with their back function, because when you put a heavy rider on, the back may stop functioning and they just struggle to lift up and remember what I said about that sink behind the saddle and it potentially indicating that the horse needs a second look because and definitely to look at the history or ask about the history because they may not quite be strong enough to carry a rider and you'll see those horses perhaps moving more with the hind limbs out behind them rather than under or centrally more. So just bear that in mind. That's what it means. Stability. Internal stability is required if the body is to maintain posture or change position. And you can see how much limb placement plays a part in that. As you can see, this is very unstable. Gravity and surfaces constantly destabilize the moving body. So much easier to work in a neat sand arena that's not deep than it is to work across natural turf terrain. And these will impact on the training of precision movement. Surfaces are utilised in gait production and counterbalancing the ground reaction forces. So think of why we might use a sand arena in preference to 
a field to work on. Stability is maintained by the nervous system, proprioception. It can be consciously educated. It's inherently acutely trainable. Think about the, the baby and how it learns to move over time and balance. The vestibular system of the inner ear where fluid levels feed back information to the body to give it a sense of tilt or leaning so that the body can be corrected. And there are mechanoreceptors as part of the proprioceptive system. And after we've done all the hard work perfecting our balance system and stability and just our general equitation and all that it encompasses, we can experience some trauma which will alter the acuity of that system. So trauma can result in increased tension, increased fear, increased vulnerability, which can trigger our primal survival systems and our tendency to want to protect injured areas. It can reduce our confidence in our ability and our concentration and lower our self-esteem. Something like falling off is a high risk for horse riders and it can do undo a lot of the hard work that we may have put into training. To summarise, Horse and rider asymmetry can be highly disruptive to precision sports movement. The tension generated within a muscle produces a pulling force across the lever mechanism of a joint to produce movement. That means that muscles pull, they never push. There can be a massive data input and output occurring in the horse and rider combination at any one time. Awareness of receptor activity may or may not reach the body's conscious awareness, or it may reach conscious awareness for a short period of time. And that's how sometimes it's difficult to train a horse. Posture dictates gait, balance and foot balance, and we'll look at that in more detail in the next presentation. Stability and balance are fundamental requirements for equitation so that if you can help your rider to achieve stability and improve their balance, that will make them much better riders. There can be thousands of repetitions of aberrant movement in a ridden session. And psychological trauma can have an adverse biomechanical effect on performance. OK, so you've probably gathered by now I'm going to beat this stability into you more so than skill, because I think that uh, it's a much more important trait if you can develop stability in a rider. Uh, more so than what you might perceive to be skill. We will determine how the rider might inhibit equine gait, list the basic components of posture, relate posture to functional axes of spinal and locomotor muscles, expand on the accepted concepts of static conformation, describe what's meant by core strength, describe the differing needs of core strength by the horse of, and rider, relate the position of the neutral pelvis to muscle recruitment, outline how stability of the horse and rider affects dynamic posture, Recognise and explain the difference between good and poor static posture. 
discuss a variety of challenges relating to maintaining good posture and carry out a postural evaluation of the rider. Let's first look at the equine dynamic core postural muscles, which coincidentally, a lot of these muscles we happen to be seated on when we're riding. Longissimus dorsi, iliocostalis, which is adjacent to longissimus dorsi, rectus abdominis, Iliopsoas, an important postural muscle. External abdominal oblique, another important postural muscle. Pectoralis, supporting the thoracic sling mechanism. Latissimus dorsi, which operates the thoracic limbs. And spinalis which helps to support the neck with some involvement of thoracic sling engagement or support of it. We can see many of those muscles in action here. So there's plenty there to be inhibited if we place a saddle and a rider on the horse. In trot, the spine is more stable, but I want you to look at this torsional movement here. So as uh, the front end of the body goes in one direction, the pelvic end goes in the other. And you can see right under where the rider sits is where that motion is coupled. OK, did you all get what I said there? I just uh, want to uh, re reiterate that because it's quite important. In the trot, the as, say, for example, the right shoulder or the right wither region sinks, the opposite is um, raising. So you get two different directions in the body when the horse is trotting. It's because they're trotting in diagonal pairs. So if you replay this film or watch very carefully, you'll see that in the middle of the spine is actually where the, the, the torsion, the actual point of torsion as the spine rotates in two different directions. And that is directly under the rider's seat bones pretty much, unless they're sat up here in their saddles. So I just want you to um, appreciate that reverse coupling going on there. The horse is not simply going up and down, well, that may feel like that. Uh, and this movement is possibly blocked from us by rigid saddles that, yeah, there is a point that the rider sits in the middle and reverse action is going on in trot. Another view of that. So a lot of it, you can see how easy it would be to inhibit gait because there is a lot of movement in the horse's back. More stable, more rigid in trot, but nevertheless, it was designed to move and transmit the forces from the hinds to the fours. And here we have the example of the rider uh, just being slightly asymmetrical in some way in their posture. And the horse is disturbed by this. They lose the cadence. See, so just perhaps of the mistime the rising a little. And begin shifting the rider around to address the issues and to form their compensations in the movement. But this is inhibition of the horse's gait. 
And here we have another example. You can see the pony's quite flat and again is attempting to shift the rider and compensate in some way. And again, this one's better, but we don't see a lot of push up in front. And these horses, whilst they're reasonably fit, neither of those are pushing up in front either. So we would like them to be more athletic and to express their normal gait that they would have without a rider on board. This is very much better. You can see how loose and cadent the horse is, how, they, how he pushes up and how the rider is less inhibitive to the horse's gait. So this is what we aspire to in transitions, uh, doesn't disturb the horse's balance. This rider's making an effort to support her posture so as not to impact on that of the horse or to keep it to a minimum. And again, just using the example of the horse on the lunge, uh, with a development tack which is attached to the horse's bit. So it's not just the rider that it inhibits the horse, it's the, it can be the tack too. It's, so it's it behind be the vertical tack. is where they get some relief from this. Look how much the limbs trail behind. Why should this horse want to push up in front and lift through the thoracic sling because this this does not encourage the horse to lift through that sling at all can you see how this horse's weight is so down look here nothing the horse is compensating look how downhill and it's all legs. There's no movement here. There's some range of motion, but it's not upwards. It's just along. Can you see how the horse is pulling along? So without the assistance of development tack and all the restrictions that go with it we can see that exercising the horse will at least show you the horse's natural movement and we can work with that from there so with the figure of eight bandage this encourages the horse to step under more behind to use its back and to push up in front with the thoracic sling. He really sits down, look at the lumbar sacral rotation there. And then I'll put some poles to that. And you can see how much body movement it's a bit minimal at the moment but he does warm up but you can see you can take the horse out put a figure of eight bandage on and he's doing his range of motion exercises straight away so the problem is it can be more difficult or more challenging to ride a horse that has a greater range of motion compared with when it has not or when it's restricted but this ought to be the way we should be going when we're riding because it, it has to be healthier for the horse's movement to block that natural movement, to block the horse's natural use of its back is to set up compensation which may impact on the horse's limbs and in turn the useful life of the horse as a ridden horse. So the aim of this is to work on the rider towards having them minimally impact on their horse's movement.
So what are the components of posture? Confirmation. We can see here that the way the horse or person is put together will dictate how they load their body down to the ground. It's dependent on the functional axes and we'll talk a little more about that later. And the body is three dimensional just because we can see it from the side or from behind. That doesn't mean that all our training has to be focused on the side or the back or the front of the horse. There is this dimension as well, looking down onto the horse here, which is the horizontal plane and where we see rotational asymmetry. And very often this is overlooked. It's because we cannot see it readily. Conditioning of the posture. We tend to work on core strength to develop posture. Proprioceptive acuity is important because the body needs to have an awareness of where it's putting its feet and where it's positioned in the space around it. And the degree of flexion and extension uh, in the joints when the body's moving. Education is an important component of posture because we very much have to learn to move efficiently and effectively. When we're lifting, for example, we know we should use our limbs more and keep our backs straight rather than just using our backs to lift. And that involves motor control. Central pattern generator development, as we talked about in the last presentation. Motivation is another component of posture. We do need to be very aware that we should be looking after our postures to preserve them. Uh, for example, when we feel ourselves slouching, we, we should sit up and adopt a better position but we need to be motivated to do that and not everybody is. Pain levels will dictate posture. This can be related to rider subclinical asymmetry. And adaptation potential, that's a very important component of posture. And what this study concluded was that instead of considering compromised gait, as a negative, it invited us to consider that the fact that the body can adapt when it's compromised is a great feat of biophysics in itself. And we can look at that in this next video. So what I want to get to you thinking about is that even though we may be compromised, there's something else at play here in the body. We strive for the perfect riding position and we strive for balance and we invest a lot of effort into this perfection of the posture, but for true perfection of the posture, we can look to the Paralympians and what they have to do with their compromised postures uh, in order to be able to ride. And it truly is magnificent that they can ride. Natasha Baker is one of the world's premier para dressage riders, having won five Paralympic gold medals, an individual silver and team gold at the World Equestrian Games in 2014. When Natasha was 14 months old, she contracted transverse myelitis, a virus which causes permanent nerve damage and severe weakening of the legs. Every competition 
that I go to, I'm humbled by everybody that is competing there. I go to a Paralympic Games and I'm just in awe seeing everybody and to see what they've come through and, and hear how they got there. And I think the power riders have to have a great mental attitude and you can't think, why me? You know, you've got to embrace what you've got and just because we've got a disability, that doesn't mean that we can't achieve things. That doesn't mean that we can't do this or that. Originally, I was permanently in a chair. I was unable to walk or use my legs at all. Had no sensation, no feeling in them whatsoever. And uh, and then gradually with physiotherapy um, and some healing, I got the feeling back slightly and was able to train myself to walk again. I feel really lucky the fact that I grew up with my disability, so I don't know what it's like to be able-bodied. Walking the way that I do is normal for me, and so therefore when I learned to ride, I learned to ride in a style that was normal for me. So I'm pretty much useless from my hips down when I'm on a horse so my legs just hang and they just go with the movement of the horse so in a video you might see them moving that that's not me that's completely involuntary movement and so I have to train the horses to different aids and because I have no sensation in my legs from yeah. basically like here down um it's it's quite dangerous obviously it means that I have to work on my core yeah. a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not the easiest thing riding without stirrups, but yeah. having done it for 20 years now, kind I'm kind of used, used to it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your core muscles definitely work hard. They do. Them. They really, really do. And it took a little bit of time, and I used to get really frustrated as well when I was trying to look for new horses. Yeah. That I would go and I would find a horse that was really bouncy that I yeah. couldn't sit to. But somebody then said, well, if they're bouncy, then they're not through and swinging over their back and yeah. that's why you can't sit to them and so I wouldn't want a horse that's not swinging over yeah. its back so actually the bouncy ones aren't right for me. Ready? One, two, three. That was a grunt jump. It's my adductors. Uh, get really really tight which is yeah. basically what enables me to walk um, is the tension and the tightness and the tone in my legs mm -hmm. is what keeps me standing and walking um, but that's not great for when I'm riding yeah. so uh, mum has to do this stretch for me before I start so I feel kind of more into the saddle You know, there's lots of people out there that could feel sorry for themselves in my situation. You know, I'm not able-bodied, I can't get up and run around and do normal things that, that people can do. It may take me a little bit longer, it may not be in the conventional way, but it'll be in the Natasha way. So yes, I do have to have an incredibly strong core, I have to have a pretty good balance. You know, loads of able-bodied riders dread a session without stirrups, but that's really made me into a, a stronger rider. So a very, very useful insight there as to what happens when we haven't got full use of our limbs. So there's clearly something else we need to be doing beyond having the perfect heel position. So just revisiting these postures, the different types of posture we can adopt, horse and rider. In this posture, it's a good square posture. 
The horse doesn't look in any way strained. They look relaxed and fairly evenly loaded over their base of support. So there doesn't appear to be any strain there or wasted energy in maintaining this posture. And we can imagine that when this horse moves away, they will move away lightly and fluently, consistently, because there doesn't appear to be any intrinsic reason why not. In this, we can see that a bit more stiffness there as the horse holds the hinds out behind with perhaps more weakness through the back. And we can see that the base of support, the compensation is to make a wider base of support than there is in front. This horse looks very strained and not comfortable at all through their narrow base of support. I am also, my eye is drawn to how the load from the pelvis and the lumbar almost jams its way into the base of the withers. So we can see that this area it actually looks like the horse is narrowing the base to give more support to this area. So this is a very different picture from this horse. This posture is also good compared with this one. In fact, it looks, I'd say, a little better because the load is being distributed relatively equally through the fours and the hinds from front to back, even though we know that the horse will be carrying more weight on the front, it just looks very square. And again, this horse, very similar to this one, is leaning over in front. So the strain appears to be down through the front limb as the horse looks like it's just pitched over and leaning over more whereas this horse looks to be moving back more and again that narrow base of support i think which tells us that this horse and this horse would not be as stable as this and this one and looking at the rider posture here here's one who's done a very good job of um, complying with the physiotherapist's directions to improve core stability. So she was doing her daily sit-ups, but because of, her, because of the effect of this muscle conditioning on her posture, she's managed to shorten the muscles on the anterior of the body. So she's pitching herself forward and also to do this or to balance, she seems to have to use some flexion of the knee to do that. The angle of the rider's ribcage connection with their pelvis can provide a lot of information about how stable they are as a rider. Riders must absorb the horse's vertical forces in their own body. This is not only for the horse's comfort and stability and performance, but their own, as being unable to counter those forces could increase their potential for bouncing in the saddle, however slight, and result in back pain. So, very good. I think you're leaning back a little, so you're a little bit organised there. Back and front's good, and now you're better. Much better. Good, very good. So I look at the angle of the ribcage positioning in relation to the pelvis and at the same time assess their potential for developing back strain. Looking at these six examples, and except for one, their shoulders are in line with their hip joints, but they vary in lumbar curves and ribcage angle. The first one has fairly good alignment with the ribs aimed into her pelvis. She's a teenager and a well-balanced rider. The second one, the ribs are aligned slightly over the front of her pelvis and thighs. She's a skilled show jumper over one meter 20 jumps. 
The third one has a marked anterior tilt of the pelvis and her rib cage is even more in advance of her pelvis. And it was recommended that she strengthen her core with floor lying sit-ups and you can see she's adopting a habitual sit-up posture because that exercise did not target her back to promote a vertical upper body posture. And that's the problem with the exercises is that you still have to get a balance in the muscle development with whatever exercise you're doing and however you're doing it. The fourth has a similar issue of the rib cage loading in front of her hip joint. It's obvious that the strain point is in her thoracolumbar region around L1 and this rider has a history of chronic back pain for many years. The fifth is close to ideal although very slightly loading the rib cage in front of her pelvis but there's no exaggeration of her lumbar curve. There is a very marked planting of the rib cage or stacking of the ribs over her pelvis. Same for the sixth although there is a marked lumbar curve. Number seven is ideal. She's a successful regional riding club dressage rider. See how the upper body of ribs and shoulders are stacked above her pelvis without an exaggerated lumbar curve. I worked with her to align her rotationally through her shoulders and pelvis to develop a firm connection between the bony triangle made by her seat bones against the saddle and that successfully resolved her postural alignment anomalies. And canter. So left hip forward, just a, a centimetre. Whatever the imprint was, let's see if we can equalise it up to the right. Yes. Marvellous. The last example has a vertical rib cage, which is good, but again, there is slightly anterior positioning in front of her pelvis. In my experience, a rider whose rib cage is aligned in front of their pelvis tip forwards in the saddle. And think of the lack of support in the lumbar region where there is only the spine and the soft tissue there. The ribs are a relatively solid, stable structure above it and the pelvis makes a relatively stable structure below it, although it can tilt. This is why developing the core muscles to achieve a stable connection between the rib cage and the pelvis is so important for riders that have to deal with vertical forces coming from the horse. These postural misalignments of rib cage and pelvic connection can be exacerbated when the rider takes up an astride seating position in the saddle. And this is where the saddle seat shape will either support an effective posture or exacerbate the loading alignment. The base of support is an important component of remaining upright and it's the contact area underneath an object or a body. So in other words, the ground. And we're all quite different in how we adopt a base of support according to our experience, our balance and our proprioception. And the greater the width of the base of support, for exa example, this one rather than this one, the more stable the body will be. You can see this is a very stable position walking backwards, uh, whereas this is perhaps not so stable. You can see that in the upper body. She just looks like she's tipping backwards, whereas this lady is firmly planting and making use of the ground contact for vertical balance. And for this perspective, for example, in jumping, a novice rider with a very slight build seated on a narrow framed thoroughbred will be less stable mediolaterally or side to side versus a wide framed draft type. So a very narrow fine horse will feel less stable than a draft horse to sit on, for example. And the rider that's heavier through the pelvis and the thighs 
may well be more stable than a rider that's heavier through the upper body. But the closer the body is to the ground or the base of support, the more stable it will be. A saddle seat can facilitate or inhibit posture. More about that shortly. And the ideal is to place the center of rotation of the rider close to the center of rotation of the horse. And we'll look at that in other pictures shortly. And in that position where two centers of rotation are close to each other, there will be minimum perturbance or minimal movement. And this is a strategy that's more easily managed by the horse and rider so that if their centre of rotation is sighted close to the horse's centre of rotation, they will find it easier to move with the horse. And if the horse has the rider sighted closer to its centre of rotation, it will find it easier to balance from below upwards or balance the load that is above it. And greater balance is aided by still movement because we don't have to make adjustments because it doesn't destabilize us. So with training or conditioning, strengthening, and the addition of muscle bulk, there will be greater core strength and that will shift the center of gravity. So this is the concept we apply to horses when we're training them that with development of their core comes the ability to shift the weight further back. So the center of gravity of the static posture is not necessarily fixed and also when the body's moving depending on the activity the center of gravity of that body is always shifting therefore the base of support must be adapted to that okay so we're just uh, getting ready for a break um just one more observation is that yeah rigid tree so if you uh, recall the horse on the treadmill and how much the horse's back moves but it doesn't just move it moves three dimensionally and it moves in two different directions uh, through the spine so yeah how how do we fit a rigid tree on a moving horse because obviously the rigid tree is more for rider support but it also protects the horse from the rider or does it <laughs> so this is why very much you need to be able to assess your horse and rider combination so that you can make sure that the type of saddle the design of saddle that they have does match them so uh, we will talk more about that shortly. But yes, wasn't it fascinating about Natasha Baker? So <laughs> you think you know how to ride, but uh, what she said was if she had not worked so hard on her core because she cannot rely on the the strength, the balance. So she hasn't got uh, the normal or the usual attributes that perhaps we take for granted as riders as we complain about our positions, etc. So there is a lot to learn from the Paralympians about the absolute, the way we ride, the way we should ride. So we can work. Uh, from from their their experience and their learning so very much she uh, she doesn't ride with stirrups <laughs> and yeah that's what what helps build her stability okay so a comment there 
I did notice that Natasha's horse was holding its head slightly to the side at times. And another comment, she was really bouncy. Yeah, I'm not saying we should all bounce around on a horse like that, but uh, she is very, very weak from the waist down. And if you imagine, if, if any of us were very, very weak, we would just fall off. So, yeah, but you did see that her mother has to help her to get deeper into the saddle because her legs are also very, very tense. So she's having like a clothes peg effect and, and she has very reduced proprioceptive control over her legs. So that's potentially why she was bouncy. Right, let's go on with our film if there's no questions. Functional axes of intrinsic stability and those that are involved with spinal support. We can see how the posture is maintained. We can see how the posture is stabilized with this system of pulleys and levers that are the muscles and the joints. And we should also be able to see what would happen if any of these structures failed. So for example, with a weak back, it may be difficult for the horse to support its head fully. And with weak abdominal muscles, that will compromise the integrity of the structure of the back. And then placing a rider on this structure, we can see how the horse's movement, see how the horse's movement can be inhibited by that additional loading. These are the muscles of the limbs. And we can see how much representation there is of these muscles in the region of the limbs. And again, how placing a rider here, if the horse was not sufficiently fit enough to cope with that rider load, how much more difficult it would be for the horse to move. And same for the rider. I won't go through all these muscles. You can pause the film and familiarize yourself at your leisure. But I just want you to see how the head is stabilized, how the shoulder is stabilized, how the rider's anterior body is stabilized, and so on. And again, in the back, shoulder stability, head stability, spinal stability, and low back, rib to pelvis stability. There is 